Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. I have here Mr. Charles Collins, and he is going to tell us not only a little bit about himself, but what he does as far as helping people to be inspired and motivated to be successful in life. How are you today, Mr. Collins? Great, Mr. Yates, but now it's going to be Charles and Kyle from now on, right? Okay, that'll work. All right, I'm with you. All Good. Right. I'm uh, I'm coming to you today from uh, the Atlantic Coast in Palm Beach County, Florida. We're having a lovely transition day from spring into summer, so the humidity is rising up and the ducks are getting feisty and <laughs> going crazy at one another in the back pond, but... Yeah, we're in a good time of year here right now. There's something about Florida that keeps calling me to it. I end up making a lot of friends over there, and mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. I just I've got to make that visit. I've flown by there, but I've never actually been in Florida. So well, you just have to remember one thing when you go to Florida. There's about five different Floridas, so you you spend a little time visiting each one of them before you decide where you want to settle. <laughs> I got you. All right. Well. Mm -hmm. We want to know a little bit about you. So tell us uh, the history of Charles. Well, um, I was born here in the United States. So I'm an American by birth, like a lot of us, and spent a lot of time, though, traveling around the world and getting imprinted with uh, a lot of good uh, ideas and thoughts and food and cultures from many other parts of the world. So uh, you'd say I'm kind of a mixed bag by this age in my, in my life and uh, raised the family uh, here in the States. And they're, uh, they're now off on their own up in the rocky coast of Maine, USA. And they're enjoying the seafood and the spray and the cold weather that thank God I don't visit them until it comes summertime. So Man, they can have that cold weather. Yeah, I'm with you on that. So they're, you know, they're raising babies and doing the things that other folks do. And uh, I spent a lot of my uh, career uh, in uh, business uh, performance management, helping businesses, you know, align their processes and get everybody on the same page rather than uh, everybody working against one another, you know, and that sometimes takes uh, a plan, as they would say, and, uh, and uh, making sure that that plan flows, you know, and, and businesses, you know, as we get into our conversation today, today's businesses are the, uh, the generational development of something that started back centuries and millennia ago, which were the workshops of uh, the mm -hmm. craftsmen and craftswomen, you know, doing their trade, going to a central place, working together, you know, uh, sometimes you'd fit a whole piece all by yourself, sometimes you'd make parts of it and other folks would assemble it. All of that stuff that we've learned for thousands of years, that's still, still going on today. It's at maybe a much larger scale. You know, talking about the petroleum refining and all the other things mm -hmm. that, you know, you're familiar with. But nonetheless, it's, it's all based on these uh, historical ancient principles of uh, workshops, workshop management, and being good craftsmen and craftswomen and making our way in life. You know, we were talking before the show that I, I got to visit a museum in Bonham, Texas, and they had an old printing press. And how they had all the separate little letters that they would fit on a print page. And then once they got that, they had a copy machine where they would make all the copies. And I thought, God, that, all the work that went into doing that, and they would do that on a daily basis, but yet they have a hard time with computers getting them out on a daily basis. I mean, come on, that's crap. That's crap. <laughs> It is craft. It's funny that you mentioned that, you know, we were, you, you were talking about, you know, your grandfather being a craft. So my, my grandfather was a typesetter at a newspaper. So he was one of the guys you just described. Oh, wow. You'd have to set up those blocks every day and, and choose the letters and choose the typeface that they wanted for the headline and what typeface was going to be down for the body copy and tap all those things into place with the little, you know, mallets that they gave them. And, uh, come home every day. And I used to see him come home every day with that day's edition of the paper underneath his arm as he passed the house and went down to the corner bar and had his beer for the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Grandpa, no, I'll be back. <laughs> probably covered in ink too, huh? Covered in ink and stinking <laughs> like it, stinking. You could smell the newsprint on the guy. Oh, those were the days, man. Uh-huh. Just something about that fresh printed newspaper but i say everything's all electronic now everybody's getting away from the printed paper and 
I miss those days. Yeah, there's some beautiful things about uh, crafts, you know, in one of the writings uh, that I talk about tools for living, you know, books uh, are one of those tools. Uh, and when you look at what a book is, and, you know, if you deep dive on what a book is, uh, as we describe in one of the episodes in the podcast, uh, we, it then says, you know, well, even though books, you know, in the printed edition, uh, they're still there, they're still with us, but more and more, as you say, the electronics are taking over. But if you have ever walked into an old bookstore or seller of rare books, and you look at the craftsmanship of those printed works, you know, up there on the shelf that are a hundred years or more old, you know, original editions, that it's like intoxicating the, the, the smell of the leather. And, <laughs> you know, it's like being in, you know, a luxury car and uh, yeah, those, those, parts of handwork craftsmanship uh those those are things that uh they, they're sensory they get they get in you and they kind of stay with you for life it's funny you mentioned about that because we were talking not only about books but how when we were kids and we would go and get the the latest record album that come out and you got to hold it in your hand and you had the artwork on the album covers and there's just something special about having that album. And then, you know, of course we had eight tracks when I was little <clears throat> and then got to be cassette tapes. Everything was getting smaller records and tapes went by the wayside and CDs came out. And I mean, we thought it was a big deal when CDs came out. I was like, how can you improve on it? And yet mm -hmm. they did now everything you don't even, you can, download it on your phone you don't even need a, a a real player to to have music anymore and one of my dreams as a kid is i always wanted to be that person that got to design an album cover oh but, yeah but those days are over they're over yeah i mean yeah they're over i guess in the way you've described it because i know what you mean i mean there was this huge pride i had friends of mine that were like crazy record collectors and they had hundreds of albums and they knew where every damn one of them was you know it looked like a big pile to me but they they could go to any section of that pile and they could pull out that album and go mm -hmm. and these guys boy the way that they would handle you handle the edges of that album man you don't touch it mm -mm. <laughs> you don't handle it by the edges and when you go to take the disc the vinyl disc out of that sleeve you know you do it with delicacy and you handle just touch the edges and then you make sure they use that little brush on that on that you know that vinyl before you drop the needle right uh, i mean just the whole ritual of the whole thing and you could look at that album cover remember that you could listen to the music and look at that album cover for hours to try to decipher like what are the hidden stories in there <laughs> you know oh yeah isn't or, that true are the ones that you could fold out and look yeah. at the inside yeah the out. double yeah the double one yeah it was there was something magical about that there was and now everything's gone so digital that i'm afraid our our grandkids are not going to get to experience and enjoy the things that we got to enjoy and they won't understand the magic of it that's a really great word the magic of it you know i think that's one of the reasons why a lot of like my my son-in-law uh i mean he's just near 40 ish or something like that boy do they love vinyl i mean they have uh you know a, an lp player and they buy vinyl and they like that experience they want that experience you know they want the 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 sound experience they want to look at that album cover and you know what we're talking about really here is um there was still very much of a human connection it wasn't too far away from that album cover that we were seeing and that record that we were listening to that pressed vinyl it wasn't too many steps removed from seeing the creator that the, that that craftsman or craftsman's hand right on that product and when you weren't too many steps away from that you were still drawn in you still had a connection to that that was the product of thousands of hours of study, work, practice, right? I mean, you just didn't come up with any old album cover. I mean, if that album cover was junk, it wasn't going to get anywhere. That though, some of those album covers were just phenomenal works of art. 
Oh yeah. And it took practice and continuous excellence and improvement, you know, and this whole idea that we talk about in life as a craft is all based on this fundamental principle that goes back thousands of years that every one of us connects to, which is when we're in front of a product or a service that we Im almost immediately categorize or interpret or experience as excellent, something that's excellent, that result, that work, which is there, there's no craftsperson near it. You're just looking at the work. It's just you and that piece of work. And when you are seeing that excellence come through, that excellence of execution, the quality of what you're experiencing, this thing called excellence of execution or craftsmanship is the center of the work we've been doing and bringing back out for people to understand. And this is not just hand work. It's also mind work that that is a universal human expression that everywhere in the world, I don't care the language or the culture or the gender, it doesn't matter that when we come into contact with those works, it just does something for us. We receive a sense of satisfaction and improvement in our own self because of the result of that excellence of execution of another person in that we may not even know their work. So now you back into who did that work. And that's a man or a woman that spent thousands of hours learning that trade, practicing that work, making it a little better all the time, finding satisfaction in themselves from like, wow, I did this. Like, look at that, man. <laughs> I just took it to the next level, right? I'm feeling good about it. I mean, whether it's a podcast or something else, that, that, that feels good. Human beings connect when they execute well they connect with themselves and it gives them a sense of pride right that hey i'm not useless man i've got skills and when you feel that that is such an extraordinarily strong driving thing inside it makes you want to climb the next mountain because you feel as though you have the capability to get there you know that you're going to have to train a little harder you know that you're going to have to push a little bit more but you're ready for it because you want that next high. And that next high is coming from your execution, your skills, right? So this whole thing that we're going to talk about today about life as a craft, it's like, well, if we do that in one area of our life that we usually call career or, you know, vocation or profession or whatever, you know, we, we've spent many hours learning it and perfecting it and getting better at it. I don't care if it's a carpenter or if it's a doctor or a lawyer, it doesn't matter human beings have to put in the time to put forward those quality works. Well, then how come we can't use that exact same model when applying it to any other area of our life? How come all these other areas of our lives are thrown at us like by intuition and by trial and error? When in fact, all those other areas of our life, whether it's something to do with our internal emotional state or our external physical state or relationships with family or just the way that we look and view and interact with society around us, I mean, those are learned skills, you know, and there's somebody that's figured out, hey, there's a body of skills here you can learn to feel better about your encounter with that thing out there, right? If you don't have skills, you're like doing it intuitively. And for many of us, you back away. You just say, I'm, I'm not going in there. You know, it's just like too much risk, you know, or I can't be bothered or you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that's the center of this whole, you and I backed into this conversation because we appreciate just in the conversation we've had together, this one thing we call the now cover, we both found in that this excellence of execution. Oh yeah. Well, and I may be way off here, but when you look at the way society is nowadays, everything is, I, I want it now. I get it now. Um, if I don't like it, then the next best thing will be around in no time. Um, if I don't like my, my picture, I can delete it off my phone, take it over again, or I got filters, all this kind of stuff. And I, I feel like we kind of treat our relationships that way as well that we want the next best thing if we don't like what we got nobody really works at it like they used to people aren't 
getting married or even staying married like they used to. I, I don't know. It's it's this world has become too convenient just to throw things away and to start all over again. Uh, like I say, I could be off, but that's just the way I feel. Well, I, I, I don't know how you can be off when, in fact, you know, you're talking about something you've experienced and probably, uh, you know, a large majority of the audience has experienced, you know, I mean, I would say that I, I see exactly what you just described. I see it out there. I see it all around us, you know, uh, and I think that we're at one of those periods in history when our tools, some of our tools have become so powerful that you don't need the thousand hours of practice mm -hmm. and perfecting in the use of that tool in order to achieve, you know, what effectively would have been years ago, an extraordinary result, <laughs> you know, I mean, like these tools are exceptionally powerful. Now, one of the things we talk about in life as a craft is tools for living. What tools are you using in your life? Where did you get those tools? Did you train on them? Or you're just picking them up and doing something with them and you really don't know how they work. And are you applying them to yourself? Are you applying them to others? And what is the result of your use of those tools when you're applying it to something? Now, let's just talk about this mobile phone thing here for a moment. How many zombie people you see walking around every day in their mobile phone? All the time. God All damn it. I mean, day. they're out in front of you walking in traffic. I mean, they're just, you know, they're off the planet. They're even driving doing this. I don't know how many wrecks we almost got in yesterday because people were either texting or, you know, talking on their phone, not paying attention to driving. Okay. So let's go, let's go to the ancient principles of craftsmanship now, which is with the, you know, the center of all this work in the way of craftsmanship for thousands of years. When an apprentice would come into the master craftsman's workshop, and I'm talking about, it could have been an apprentice in the law. It could have been an apprentice printer. It could have been an apprentice baker. It didn't matter what your profession was. It could have been a profession working with words or with your hands. It didn't matter. When you would enter into the apprenticeship phase in a trade craft or profession, you would be required to observe the journeyman and master craftsman and craftswoman in that trade, in that workshop, working with the materials and the tools that they had practiced with for thousands of hours. And an apprentice was not even allowed to touch a tool until they could name the tool, what it was used for, how you properly applied the tool to the material of one sort or another, right? And then only then were they allowed to say, okay, now let's pick up the tool and start getting a feel for it. Now let's start seeing how we apply it to whatever material, you know, baking or, or clay or wood or whatever. And let's spend the time to move up and become skilled at using those tools. Cause one day you're, you're probably gonna make your living from using those tools going out into the world, right? So now, these incredible companies come out, they produce these amazing devices like a mobile phone device that's effectively, you know, uh, uh, a NASA computer from the early space shuttles in your hand. I mean, they're extraordinary, right? Yeah. And where's the operating manual? Where's what this tool is? And what's going to happen when you start using this tool? And what happens to so many people without any training is they get pulled into the inside of that tool, their attention, and they completely lose or separate themselves from being present in the moment. They, they, they go mindless, no presence in the moment because they are so pulled into this device that they have forgotten the context of where they are driving a car, <laughs> walking down, you know, a crosswalk on a street or a road or whatever it is. And when you see someone misusing a tool, having no skill in using that tool, not having any idea what it is or how to use it, they just become fascinated like blinking lights on a pinball machine. In the way of craftsmanship, you wouldn't even be allowed to go near that tool until your mind was right. Until as an apprentice, you had learned, hey, what is this thing? 
What's it for? So everybody listen to the podcast just for a moment, you know, step back and look at now what Apple and all these other people are doing. They're putting programs on the, on the phone that try to limit the amount of time you're looking at them. Right now they're trying to program the tool so that you don't get lost inside the damn thing, you know, mm -hmm. and use, right. So all these tool manufacturers have put these things out into the world for people to use and people are just picking them up willy nilly. And so this is the whole idea behind craftsmanship, which is the concept of for thousands of years, the master craftsman would train the craftsmen and craftswomen in their, in their workshop, whatever it was. Craftsmanship is an attitude of mind. And you first and foremost start with the concept of being present and being focused on what it is that you are doing and the work that's going to be done because you're going to have your hands on material and you're going to have you move that material through processes, whatever that material is, it's going to be a law or it's going to be, you know, a, a, a three by five lumber, you know, at the end, you're going to be working with machines and tools that are powerful and be careful. You got to know how to use them. Mm -hmm. Right. So bring that back today to everybody listening to your podcast about how do we, you know, look at something, what kind of a model, what kind of an anchor can we look at to craft the rest of our life as well as we craft our trades and professions and practice them? The way of craftsmanship will teach you, you have to start with an attitude of mind that has you present and focused on the work to be done. Right. And there's a lot of people that don't give a damn. They're going to say, I don't want to make it. I'm fine. I don't need to make a masterpiece of my life. Well, we're not talking to you today. You're right. <clears throat> we're, we're talking to folks that are interested in, hey, I want to, I think I want to go up to that next mountaintop. I think I want to polish this area over here. I, I, I don't want to abandon relationships and, you know, the throwaway husband and wife and whatnot. I want to be good at it. I want to be skilled at it. For those of you that want to be skilled, well, this podcast is for you. I sure remember when we were learning how to drive a car, you had to learn how to drive a standard before you could drive a, an automatic. They made you do it. Exactly. Now kids don't know what that is. You know, I mean that eventually, you know, they took it away and said, you know, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Why? Because there are practically no standards on the road anymore, except if, you know, you have certain kinds of trucks and tractors and whatnot. And, the, and then they want that standard. They want to be able to, you know, control that gear, get, get, get out of the ditch in the field or wherever the heck you are. Right. right. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Not on the open road. It's just kind of, no, I'm going to get in that BMW and just glide. Well, it's going to come a day when we don't even know how to need to know how to drive. You just get in and say, Hey, take me so-and-so place and psh, off your car goes. Well, man, that's what they're doing now. Right. Exactly. It's All right. It's driverless, nuts. driverless vehicles. Yeah. Doing it with the trucks are doing, you know, technology, you know, these tools, you know, so in the way of craftsmanship, there's a whole class of craftsmen and craftswomen that are the tool makers. You know, we have a whole episode on this and they're, they're really interesting people. <laughs> I mean, they are always thinking about, how to improve something, how to make it a little better, how to, you know, streamline, how to make a little bit lighter, or a little bit heavier, how to, how, you know what I'm saying? They're, 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 and, and they, they're always thinking about, because this is what's really interesting about tools and craftsmanship is you sit back and you say, well, what the hell is a thing for anyway? You know, well, what's, what, what's a tool for? Well, you, you can cut this with it. You can dang, you know, whatever you can level this with it. You can do that and say, well, but what is it doing? And when you look at what a tool is doing, it is actually concentrating the energy of the craftsperson so they can accurately apply that energy to the material or the task that they're doing. It's an extension of the craftsperson. The level's an extension of your eye to get something just right, you know, and, 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 and then bang, you snap it in with a gun. Well, if we look at all these tools, then tools are remarkable devices, you know, which are constantly extending our power and our capability. Now, there's no stopping this idea that tools are getting more powerful and more powerful all the time, extending human capabilities. I mean, you know, we're coming to that science fiction place <laughs> where yes. you're wearing stuff, right? You know, that just, you know, lets you lift a thousand pounds like, you know, nothing. 
um, you know, we're, we're coming and the tool makers are always going to be taking us up to that next level, but we're not bound by the tools we use. We don't have to use them, but if we do use them for those that are thinking about who am I and what am I all about? This is where the concept of the way of craftsmanship comes into your life because then you're looking at it and saying, okay, what is that thing? All right. Am I going to pick it up and am I going to use it? And am I going to use it skillfully in applying it to myself and improve something in my material? So I end up making a masterpiece of my life over time, or am I just not going to give a damn anyway? You know, and just pick it up and throw it around and use it and just, you know, go down and walk across the crosswalk or drive the car looking at the mobile phone. <laughs> you know? Which one are you going to be? There's something about making something with your hands. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I kept after my grandfather passed away was his set of carving tools. There's just a satisfaction in sitting there and taking a piece of wood and creating it into something that is in your head, like you said, and somebody else being able to enjoy what you just created. And even if anybody else doesn't enjoy it like you do, at least you you could say, I made that. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, isn't it true? I mean, isn't that as like, we all, we all have sensed that sometime, somewhere in our life, right? And we, we you know, and it, you, it kind of, it's like kind of like a bug, you know, you do, you do it once and you kind of, oh, that wasn't, you know, I kind of like that, you know, that wasn't too bad. So what, what do you do? You know, a couple of days later, you're sitting back on the porch and you grab another stick and you start whittling again. Right. And all of a sudden over time, you're just like, no, nah, I'm whittling every day now. <laughs> and you just mm -hmm. kind of go right. And what are you doing? You're putting your mind and your body in a state of flow. You are in the same place at the same time, connected, flowing, and it almost becomes a moment of weightlessness, right? Now hold that thought just for a moment, because you just took us to a beautiful place, right? Hold that thought just for a moment, that, 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 that fundamental thought that everybody can feel. And now I'm going to take you into the craftsman's workshop, because the master craftsman would first and foremost, have an apprentice whose mind was everywhere. You know, they're, they're doing something. And the next thing you know, is they're like floating off on their mobile phone, you know, mentally, you know, going somewhere else, you know, and they come across the back of the, you know, whack them with a wooden spoon in the back of the head and say, come on, stay focused, stay where you are, be mindful, get into it. And he's planing wood. Well, one day after getting whacked with a wooden spoon on the back of his head for I don't know how long, Master comes along and sees that apprentice and, he, and he's planing wood and he's just planing and he's planing and he's playing and, and he looks like a, a, a champion ice skater, just shoo. and he says, how's that feel, son? Man, he says, I'm lost. I'm in it. I'm deep working. I'm way down inside somewhere, right? This deep workplace in the way of craftsmanship that you just described, we want to go back there. We want to find the vehicles, right? Whether it's wood or whether it's inside the pages of a book or wherever it is, we want to find those vehicles that help take us back into that place of flow. And this is where craftsmanship is the, the art and science of skillful living, because you then start to realize you have to know those materials, right? You, you end up banging on them too hard and they're going to split, they're going to break, right? So this is where now the science, the study comes in, the observation, the hours of practice. Every darn thing that we do that we do well like that took us the time to do it. And it took us the continuous being present to see something new and to feel and to get to that next place, that, that moment of like, and you're on the back whittling. Boy, you can just go there. Oh, you can yeah. just poof. <laughs> and the next thing you know, it's like, wow, here, you know, here I am. Now, when you start doing things well that other people want, you know, depending upon the society, <clears throat> excuse me, or, or where, where in the world you learned your first craftsmanship in a certain trade, depending on the school that you went to for learning that trade, you know, it could be a university, it could be a, 
uh, uh, you know, a plumber's workshop. It doesn't matter. Depending on where you went, they were either going to teach, they were going to teach you one or two ways. They're going to teach you, all right, you're going to do good work. You're going to do skill because if you do shoddy work and we have to redo it over again, that means we're going to lose the job with the customer and everything else and bang, you're fired, right? So that's one way of teaching you to do the work because you're not going to get paid if you do bad work. But the other thing that many craft traditions would teach you is they would put you through a test and say, who are we doing that work for? Who is the work for? And they would say, well, it's for somebody who's got a broken pipe. Say, okay, who are they? Well, they're the recipient of the work. They are the person that is going to receive the end product, the result of the work. And they would ask him, well, who benefits by that? So, well, they do. I mean, it improves something for them, right? And so in the craftsman school, they would teach you the true essence of craftsmanship was not just the thousands of hours of time and practice and improvement to execute your work with high quality and excellence, but that work had to have a positive impact on the society who's receiving that work. Now look at your work. What are you putting out there? Are you putting out there something that is positively impact the end recipient so that it brings them, oh, thank you, <laughs> satisfaction, right? A sense of, ah, uh, or that hurt me. That did something bad to me. Your work did not improve my life. In fact, it interfered with it and hurt it. Look around. How many people you see putting work out there that are not benefiting society? They're not benefiting that any customer. What that is. So they would teach you, you're not a craftsman until your work does the, both of those things. It's for you and it's for others to benefit from. Then you can call yourself a craftsman. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I spent 20 years of my career working for the city. Okay. And I worked in the water department and uh, I was a heavy equipment operator for all, all many of those years. And there was a satisfaction and almost like you say, you get kind of lost when you're doing your, your craft. I'd get on a machine and everything that bothered me in the world would just go away. Cause all I was focused on was how smooth that bucket was digging up the dirt and how well I was setting grass off to the side, cleaning up after I got done and, and putting everything to back to make it look as close to what it was before I even got there. And it was a satisfaction in that. Just, it's amazing how you can apply that. <laughs> well, isn't it true though? It is very true. Right. I mean, can you see that there, that, that, that particular craftsman's practice that you were just doing, and by the way, you just described, you know, that what a lot of people are going to relate to, you know, that practice, the way of craftsmanship, everything you described, the manner in which the work was done, which was the process you were applying the skill by which you were using the tools that backhoe whatever it was that you were digging the manner in which you were creating the finished work of putting the grass back in place just the proper right way the cleanup in the area to make sure that it, the presentation was just right before you said that work is now released that work is now complete that work is now finished man we can do that to anything and everything in our life. Think about it. Relationships with family, the way we raise our children as parents, are we skilled? Do we do it in the craftsman-like manner you just described or not, right? Do we, is it like going to that work that you were just talking about in that damn backhoe, you just put, throwing it any old place and boop, the dirt's ending up over here and this. You walk into a work site, you can look at it and you can tell right away, these guys don't know what the hell they're doing. Mm-hmm. Right. They're upside down. You know, they, they don't know how to run that equipment. They don't know how to prep the site. They don't know how to finish off and clean the site and just button it up. They're not squared away. I mean, we get this as people. And anytime we do it for ourselves and for others, everybody wins. But we're not taught this. We're only 
brought into it through one doorway or another called a career, a trade, an occupation, a profession. And only within that particular narrow area are we taught the way of craftsmanship as defined by that trade, right? That trade will have determined you know, your craftsmanship, how well you prep the area, how well you use those tools, how well you laid out the finished work, how well you buttoned it up, you know, that would have been, hey, that was a great job. That was a good look at the quality of that work. All right. So that trade defines craftsmanship with its own particular set of rules and criteria. And every trade does. But the fundamental things are always the same, no matter what trade, craft, profession, occupation you're in. There's the attitude of mind, which comes from learning, study, practice, and focus. There's then the way you're going to go about handling the materials of that trade, you know, whether it's dirt and grass and, you know, uh, let's say, you know, piping for the water systems or whatever the heck it might be. There's the processes by which you're going to execute, which you have to practice and do little by little and improve. I mean, you didn't get on that bucket and handle that well the first time you get on there with the levers and everything. I mean, <laughs> you know, you probably do well. Damn, we're in there, turn the thing over, right? I mean, you know, but that took hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours. And then finally, the utilization of the tools of that craft. What tool do you use? Do you use a backhoe to cut that you know, hole or you use a spoon? Get the hell out of here. I'm not going to use a spoon, right? You got to know the right tool for the job, how that tool is built, how it's used, how it's cared for, you know? Do you lay that bucket down and close it up so that it's tight on the ground and it's not a danger to somebody when you're off the site, right? Or do you leave that arm just hanging in the air, you know, with that claw, right? You can tell, wait, wait, wait a minute, man, you didn't stow that tool away right before you left the work site, right? So those same fundamental principles, focus of mind, know the material you're working with, whether it's mind material like thoughts or whether it's, you know, material of like the earth or wood or whatever it might be know the processes and practice and study and know the tools of your trade. Every trade has those same fundamental principles. We call them the universal principles of excellence. Mm -hmm. And everyone listening to this podcast, including you, can look into something in their life where you can see, oh, I, I, I see those four things. You know, you saw it in your career for 20 years, right? And after 20 years, you probably became a master at, at a number of those things. Now, we can't be a master at everything because it takes too much time, thousands of hours of practice and study and observation to master something, right? Where you can just say off the top of your head, no, that's gonna happen now, that's gonna happen first. And not just know what that process is, but execute with a high level of skill to do that thing, right? So that takes a lot of time. Like we were talking about earlier, you know, you get, you remove the human being out of there, you know, and you don't see, I mean, we can get machines to do certain things for us, but they can only do so much, only what we program them to do, right? They're still mimicking people right. at the end of the day, right? So take that what you've learned and what you became a master. Say now, how many other areas of my life do I have the same amount of time and hours and everything that I can become a master at? Say, well, not too many, right? Because it just takes a heck of a long time. So one of the big things you were talking about earlier is that you know, in this day and age of the internet, all this nonsense going around, which is, you know, you can do this in five seconds. You know, you can learn to be a master in that in 20 minutes. You know, take my course for $1,200 and you'll be a master in 30 days and blah, 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 all of this crap. And what you realize is how much of that is absolute nonsense when you fully understand what getting to a master's level is in any trade or craft. And then you realize I have to be selective you know, which things will I master? And for most of us, our careers, our occupations, professions is one area of our life that we do eventually become masters, right? If we work at it. But there's so many area, other areas of our lives. We don't need to be masters. We can be journeymen and journeywomen, skilled, skilled practitioners in that area. But we don't have to push ourselves to supposedly become master in those areas because you'll never make it. There's just too many damn things and it takes too much time and effort but you can be skilled. And this is what the concept here is of the way of craftsmanship. If you're looking around at other areas of your life and you don't feel good about them, you feel out of balance. You feel like I'd like to be better at that. I'd like to feel better at this. I really don't have any skills in that area. 
And the problem is, is that when you're a master at something, you get this thing inside where you want to be that good in everything else. And it frustrates you not to be good in something else because you, you're, you've spent so many time becoming this. You've got, a, you've got a master spirit in you from your trade or your craft. But then when you go to attempt something else, it's just like, this is a pain in the ass. I can't do this. I'm frustrated, right? Because you're not at master's level in that other thing. And it can really piss you off. It can make you throw a hammer across the room, right? Yeah. Isn't it true? Very right? true. Yeah. And it's really hard to back out of that and say, okay, I don't have the time to be a master at that, but I can become skilled. And that may be the, the level only that you need, you know, to be an apprentice and learn and then do some practice and be practiced at a, a journeyman and a journeywoman. They're not yet masters, but they're out in the world making their living. In other words, they've learned their skills and they're trading on their skills in the workplace. And over time, they'll become masters, but they still do good work. They still do skilled quality work. Well, we can do that in other areas of our life. If we approach those areas of our life with the way of the craftsman as your mindset, mm -hmm. I have to do some learning. Okay, where can I get the where can I get the information? Where can I get the learning from? You know, we can go to a mentor. We we find them in our town, in our family, and on the internet, wherever. Find a mentor that knows that area. Take in some learning. Okay. Yeah, I'm starting to get the idea of what the, the, the body of knowledge is here. And then incrementally start some practice in that area to acquire some skill in that area. It could be parenting, right? It could be financial management in your home. It could be the way that you run or operate your house. You know, it's like a mini workshop, right? Yes. So all of those things for anybody listening that has a craftswoman or a craftsman in some area, it doesn't have to be paid, but something that you've spent a thousand hours, you know, to practice and learn and study and improve. And you get the message we're talking about here. If you take the craftsman's mindset, you can now turn your gaze on anything you want to do in life and approach it in the way of craftsmanship rather than approaching it intuitively by trial and error. Yeah. Does it make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and we get it, right? We've got something in our own life that we can relate to just about every one of us. So we can say, yeah, I've already got that skill deep within me. I just now have to bring it to the surface and remind myself I still have to be an apprentice from the beginning, no matter what else you want to look at so that you don't get so pissed off <laughs> because you, you got a master's mind in one thing and you, you, and you automatically want to be that master in those other things. And we, we just can't, you have to be an apprentice in any new thing you start. I can easily go back to doing backhoe work again, but I'm trying to learn something new and okay. in the editing and, and, the, the creative process of making these videos and, and the audio podcasts. And I just like doing the editing part of it now, but I'm, I've got a long way to go. I don't know that much. I know a little bit. I'm a lot further than what it was when I first started. And I, I just feel like that's something I want to do the rest of my life. So there you are. So you're now in the apprenticeship phase. Yes. And you're learning the processes. You're learning the tools. Mm -hmm. You're learning the materials of this trade, which are these videos and audios that you're going to be, you know, that, that, then you're going about doing that finished work and packaging them, doing the editing, getting graphics, possibly getting some music backgrounds in there and all those different things. You're learning a trade, man. Right? Yes. You know you are, and you're learning it from different uh, mentors, teachers, you know that that are out there that are saying, okay, here's some techniques and how you can do some editing, and here's some of this, and that, right? There, there's not necessarily well-known, formalized podcast schools or institute trade schools yet. There will be there that will you be. go into, right? And different schools teach you know the trade different ways, but nonetheless. Now you're taking a master's mind, you know, from backhoe work and all the other work that you did for all of those years. And you have the ability to focus yourself in on this 
because you've been a master, you've, you've developed the master's mind already in your life. So now you say, you know, you're fortunate enough, say, if you bring that up to the surface, you can keep yourself on task, learning this new trade, going through the apprenticeship phases, building that knowledge and that skill repetition before you're out in the journeyman or journey work phase, right? And you're now out in the world making your living from it, you know, that, 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 that takes time, but you can't get there. And who knows, God knows, you could go all the way to mastery in this thing if that's what you want to do. That's what I want. There it is. So what we've done is you say, if, if life is a craft, meaning all of life, just like all the other thing, you know, the, the, what we do in our careers or trades or occupations, what if we looked at the entirety of life as a craft and not just one thing or two things? What if we looked at all the things? The way we raise our families is part of that craft. The way we run and operate our household is part of that craft. You know, teaching our children their heritage, where they came from, the heritage and where they live now today, and what they may be passing on to their future generations is part of teaching them who they are. That's part of the craft. Family and personal finance, part of the craft. So what if you took all these things and said, wait a minute, all of that is called the craft of life. Okay. So now, if I treat life as a craft and not a terror, <laughs> this intuitive thing that comes at you that I'm waiting, but rather I'm approaching and saying, what do I need to learn or want to learn? What do I want on my workbench today to approach and learn and get better at so that it's no longer bothering me anymore? You know, I don't have enough money by the end of the month. I got too much month for my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's only the 20th of the month, the money's gone. Okay, well, maybe there are ways, right? Maybe you need to acquire more money, but maybe the way in which you're manning, managing and learning, have you ever learned finance for yourself and your family? Maybe you haven't. Okay, so that's part of the craft of life. Let's put that on the workbench and let's start moving that into the forefront and be an apprentice and then move up into, okay, I'm skillfully handling the money now. And I've got ways to maybe make additional money. And here's all, you know, now instead of handling it intuitively or not handling it at all and ignoring it because you don't have skills, way too many people just walk away from stuff and ignoring it because they don't want to deal with, man, that's work. Mm -hmm. Well, making a masterpiece is not easy work, but that's why it's a masterpiece <laughs> because it's a high quality, beautifully executed piece of work that by the end of the day, you stand back and look at that and go, man. So a lot of people say, no, I work too hard in my job and my profession. I don't want to do the rest of that kind of work in the rest of my life. God bless. Well, everybody wants everything right now. That's the problem. Okay. Who taught them that? Well, surely it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> right but but there it is it, it, it's like where did you learn to view life the way you view it well a lot of it has to do with the fact that we've made things so simple like you say your computer is right there on your phone mm -hmm. and i mean let's face it our our generation kind of kicked that off with you know, improving on these computers and, you know, making them smaller until now they're compact in your hand and all the programs and stuff, but everything's right at a, a touch of the, of the finger or now it's to the point of you just talk to your phone and it pulls everything up for you, making everything sure quicker, 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 quicker. You know, you, you can't sit and enjoy waiting for a nice meal. You want that meal right now. Gotta That's have it, it at you my want, house. You want, a five, you want a five star meal at McDonald's speed. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just not feasible to really create something that's gonna be that good, that masterpiece. You just said it. I'm with you. There is a point in where you have to stop and say, you know, there's a heck of a lot of people that do not mind somebody else running their life for them. And that's their choice. You know, I mean, you're your own masterpiece. Each of us is the craftsperson of our own lives. Mm -hmm. And you either, you either accept that 
idea or you don't. But for those that accept that idea, for those that like that feeling of getting better, and a lot of us like that feeling, right? A lot of us are just drawn to it. Others are not. Others are just like, I'm, I'm happy to let Walmart run my life. I'm happy to let the phone tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, all this because it's like easy, man. Okay. They're not listening to this podcast anyway, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Well, there's so many that are like, well, why do I need to learn the skill when all I got to do is tell the computer to do it and it does it for me? It's, and, it's too easy. Nobody right. Wants to do our tool, hard. our tool. That's it. Our tools are powerful and it's easy and we can slip into those places. And if you stay in those places long enough, you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. you, you just, you just, you know, turn off TV's on. Okay. There's a, you know, X, Y, Z talk show and, oh, they're making me laugh because I got some poor people on there that they're making fun of and God knows what they do in those talk shows. And, you know, and people that there is something to hold your attention outside of you, which prevents you from being present inside of you, right? Your phone holds your attention outside of you, the TV, you know, the, the, all these things, they pull you outside of you. And, and the question is, Who's running those things? Well, somebody else. Those are somebody else's machines. That's all you got to do is turn it on and say, hey, we promise to entertain you 24 seven. You don't have to worry about a darn thing. You bored? You looking for something to do? We'll make you laugh. We'll get goofies on here on TV that'll, you know, put their lives out there and have people laugh at them and do all these other kinds of, I mean, there's, you know, it's the Coliseum, you know, it's the circus. I mean, oh, there, yeah. there's somebody out there to do things for everybody, but <clears throat> for those people that get sick and tired of that or never embrace that to begin with, say, I myself want to feel good about myself. I, I myself want to learn that, or I myself want to bring my skills up to the next level in this or that for those people that have a sense of, I want to do or be something that are self starters in that regard that have not gone to sleep, then the way of craftsmanship as we're talking about it here, we're putting it on your desk for consideration. Because once you start understanding what we're talking about, and that you can be the craftsman or the craftswoman of your own life. And that through time, through incremental improvement, you can achieve incremental excellence and excellence of execution eventually as you start moving to the fourth phase of your life mentorship you're going to look back and you've made a masterpiece of your life instead of it's somewhere like it's a rotting shell an imitation look-alike you know somewhere in the junkyards of life just sitting there and there's all too many lives that are in that place you know, the bells and whistles, the, the lure of I can have it now. That's what's taken over our society. When you know, we used to wait for a movie to come out, it would be, it would take them at least three years to make a movie. Mm -hmm. Now, if it takes more than a year, then something's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, I do. I mean, you think about when George Lucas came out with star Wars each movie, it was about three years before the next movie came out. And now within a year, year and a half, it's already the next one's in, in the theaters. There's, you can see that the quality of the movies have gone downhill. Now the bells and whistles have improved, but the quality of the movie has gone downhill. You could tell the, the passion that George Lucas put into his movies. You could tell that the the Jedi had to work hard to become a Jedi. And now they want to send you a movie where, oh, this person's just born with the abilities, didn't have to work at it or anything. Boom, already a master Jedi. That, that's ridiculous. What's happened? What happened to the work ethic? Having to work for something. 
Heck, I, I I remember talking to someone the other day about how we used to get the the Sears catalog when we were kids, mm -hmm. and you'd go and you'd look at the the toy section or you know whatever. I used to like to look at what they had of the NFL, whether it be the pennants or the jerseys or t-shirts, whatever. And you'd order it from Sears, and it'd take about six weeks before you got it. But that anticipation waiting for it to come in the mail and then when you got it you were so excited and now you just push a button and sometimes within 24 hours it's at your door there's there's no build-up or anticipation of those things we've lost that it's sad it's sad it's sad well i think you use a really you know it, i think you when you said quality you know, when you were talking about the quality of his work, you know, which was this excellence of execution, it, it was something that you saw, right? George Lucas wasn't present, right? Skywalker, you know, uh, studios wasn't present, you know, industrial light and magic where they did all of the stuff wasn't present. You were just looking at his end product, his end work, what he put on the table as his craft work. And in that you saw something you called quality. You saw excellence of execution. You saw something that was coming through that was beyond the characters and beyond the, the story. You saw that whole thing as art and science, all in one package, one bundle. There it was beautifully executed, right? And you went to it. That's the result of excellence of execution. That's the result of craftsmanship. And when craftsmanship gets removed from the process, and it becomes an, a look-alike object, you know, one after another, one after another, one after another on the assembly line. There's, there's a place for that in the world. It brings products in a lower cost way that more people can enjoy and use them. And there's benefits to society from something like that. But don't try to force that into or make it feel as though that that is high quality craftsmanship and that it's going to satisfy that side of things. When you start to, when you see craftsmanship, then you start to recognize it. And this is a really critical thing about the way of craftsmanship. All the things that we talk about in the podcast and the writings on life masterpiece journal, all of these things is through the exercise of what you just did is to recognize true craftsmanship from Okay, skilled workmanship, or in some cases, mediocre or poor workmanship or no workmanship at all. And you yeah. see a lot of people walking around, man, whose lives are cheap imitation lookalikes. You know, they're trying to, in a matter of a few seconds, look like this thing they saw on a pod, you know, video, TikTok, whatever the heck it might be. And heck, we all do that. And, you know, I mean, we were kids. Yeah. We wanted to wear our hair a certain way and do this and the other. I mean, that's part of our cultural branding. That's cool. But when that becomes it and it hasn't penetrated down into side what the quality of that human being is, is an entirety, that's what people are missing. They don't get that craftsmanship has to go deep. It's that quality thing. It's like when I, if I was to buy a clock, and you know you can go look buy something that looks fancy but most of the parts are plastic or <laughs> you know you could tell they're prefabbed right okay maybe it looks okay and it maybe it works okay but the clocks my grandfather used to make where the a lot of the pieces were hand carved a lot of detail and care was put into each little part and it it looked like it and the parts that he used lasted a long time i mean i've got grandfather clocks that were handed down to me that um they're just now needing to get fixed and they've been around since like the 40s you know they're just now needing to be fixed but yet i can buy one at walmart and two years from now I'm probably throwing it away, going to buy another one because it doesn't work anymore. You know, you just did a beautiful thing with your grandfather. So let's let's go deep inside that, right? He, he made all those parts, right? Let's talk about the effect of that on your grandfather. Okay. Okay. So now 
he's working at those parts and pieces, right? Mm -hmm. What's he doing? Be, be your grandfather for us for a moment. Where is he? What's he into right there when he's doing that work? Well, every time I saw him, mm -hmm. he was in his workshop, mm -hmm. which he built by himself, by the way. He built his own workshop. And you could just see he was lost in what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the world was kind of just shut off from him while he was in that moment. And he was putting his love and his care into everything he did. He used to build doll houses too. And people would come and they would order them. And it'd usually be about three months before they would be built. And you'd think, well, why would it take three months to build a doll house? Well, because each little banister, each, uh, each little shingle was all made by hand. They weren't prefab bought at the store. No, he had his lathe and he would make the little banisters and stuff on the lathe or mm -hmm. he would hand cut each and every shingle, put those on there. He ran wiring through it just like it was a regular home. And so each room had its own little light. The uh, fireplace, he'd have a little red bulb in the fireplace. So you looked like there was a fire going in the fireplace each piece of furniture he would make by hand the only thing that didn't look real in it was the little little figures that he put in there everything else looked like it had been shrunk down from regular size and people loved what he did they paid good money for what he did because you could tell the craftsmanship and you could tell the love that was put into it. What do you think it did to him? It gave him a very big sense of pride. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, uh, he used to be a welder. Mm -hmm. He worked at Exxon for years. And back in 1965, uh, him and another gentleman were in a, a cherry picker. And while they were welding, the it arced and snapped the line that was holding them up and both fell. My grandpa was paralyzed from the waist down. Oh my God. And so, uh, he could have easily just laid back and, you know, took the, uh, money he got from Exxon and from retirement and everything else and just lived off that. But he, he had more pride than that. He wanted to be able to do something something productive and something that brought him a sense of purpose. And that's what he did. You, I mean, man, you just use so, so great, you know, pride, productive sense of purpose and think about what it was doing to his inner mind and his outer hands. When he's doing that work, you talked about that delicate work. He's, he's got, he's focused. He's, he's deep. Probably every single time he did something, he did a little different, a little better. And he paid attention to what he was doing. Do you think he was mindful? Do you think he was in his work when he was doing it at the oh, moment? Most definitely. You could right? tell that that's where his mind was at, was what he was doing. And I mean, he lived till his mid nineties. And it's no doubt that he'd still be here today. But un unfortunately, you know, his, his health had declined to the point where he was not able to work in his shop anymore. And it seemed like once that was taken away from him, he kind of lost that will to live mm -hmm. and his, his health deteriorated from that point on. So, and I see that with a lot of people, they retire. I'd see guys retire from the city and then they would just not do anything. And it seems like once their sense of purpose was taken away within a couple of years, they were dead. And that's sad. So what we're talking about here to the audience from, from the work, you know, making a masterpiece of your life and life as a craft is this idea that if you're not present and working on your own life, just the way your grandfather, you were just talking about using those words and if people need to rewind and listen to what, you know, Kyle said about his grandfather, you need to be present in your life, working on your life 
instead of giving it over to the mobile phone and the talk shows that are outside you and that you're not, you're not doing anything. You're sitting there passively like a sponge, just receiving this stimulation coming at you. You're, and you're not engaging in yourself. You're letting somebody else program you. Mm -hmm. To be a craftsperson of your own life, you need to be present. You need to be into the work. And if you start doing it like Kyle's, you know, grandfather, like your grandfather you were telling us about, imagine feeling the same things that he felt, but you're working on your own life and you're feeling the things that he felt when he was working on that dollhouse. You know what I'm saying? Your life is a dollhouse. Your life is, you know, all of those things. It's something to be crafted. So man, you can get that jazz. You can get that if you follow the way of craftsmanship and we'll see it around us all the time. So you have your grandfather who you took lessons from in craftsmanship. You, you ended up applying them in your own life, in your own trade, your own work. Now you're onto something else. You don't need me or anybody else to teach you what craftsmanship is, but everybody's got to decide whether or not they're going to pick up the way of craftsmanship and craft their own life or just leave it to the wind and let the rain pound it and see what happens. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take my grandmother, for instance, my grandmother's still alive. Mm -hmm. she's just now in in her mid 90s and I, I hope that there's any women listening you understand what i'm trying to say yeah, women each woman has a different idea of what their purpose is some of it's working and some of it's taking care of their household and i say whichever one you want to do you go for it and, uh, far be it for me to tell you how to live your life but my grandmother took a lot of pride in how she took care of her house and how she took care of my grandfather and how she took care of us kids. And she used to sew and do all that kind of stuff when she wasn't being a homemaker and her arthritis and things like that started to take over. She was not able to, to do a lot of the sewing that she used to do. Her eyesight went, and now she doesn't really take care of the household and you could see her every time i go visit she deteriorates a little bit more each time and you can just tell she wants to get up and do things but she knows that she can't when you lose that purpose whether it's working in a workplace or working at home when you lose that you will see yourself deteriorate yeah and i think that's what uh I think that's what part of our the, the the work that you know we have done is taking it out to that next level because too often for too many thousands of years too many of us in fact i'm afraid to say almost all of us have been trained in too narrow an area to focus our attention and to become craftsmen or craftswomen in and not given the framework that says all of life is a craft, not just your homemaking, okay. not just your work uh, with the backhoe or up on the cherry picker or wherever else it may be, that all of your life is there to be crafted and part of that craft. So that if one portion of our lives should change or modify, due to time and circumstances and so forth and our aging i mean we're an organic material we age just like wood you know so i mean you have to expect that there are changes that are going to set in if we're given that mindset from young people then we would always realize there are areas of our life available to us to polish a little bit improve a little bit craft a little bit be engaged with when other areas of our lives kind of shut down right or no longer as active as they maybe once were you know one of the big things in life is a craft it talks about the four phases of living which are just like in every trade apprentice journeyman masterworks and mentorship and it talks about when we get to age 65 and beyond after having been skilled journeyman and journeywoman in our careers our trades our homemaking right young family bringing them up making a good home and we move on to mastery 
And we've been journeymen, journeywomen, and masters in our trades, occupations, professions, homemaker, whatever it may be, that after having attained those levels of proficiency, then around age 65, there's this big myth that says, okay, now we're going to just kind of shuttle you out to pasture, right? 65, it's time for retirement, you know, you're, mm -hmm. and for the next 20 years or something, quote, find something to do. Come on, man. You've been working all your life. Go on out and rest and the other kind of thing and say, well, why would I want to just dissolve after age 65? That's not what, that's not what human beings do, but that's what society tells you to do. And in life as a craft, you need to have another level waiting for you. The level of eldership in which you not only have respect, but you now have a responsibility. It's time to gather together learnings and teachings and my master's journal and heirlooms and things for the family over this next period of time to create this package of wonderful goody things that's now going to be a heritage I leave down to my next generation coming up behind me right? An artifact, a craft work of your life, like your own presidential library. You know what I mean? That's what you need to leave to the next generation because they need to then take that up. That's part of their heritage. And that's part of life as a craft. Where do you come from? Who are your people? What worldviews do they have? What worldviews did they have? I mean, I have ancestors that came from Europe, from Ireland and Italy and other places. I, I didn't grow up there. I've learned about their lives. I've learned who they were as people, but that wasn't my present heritage, my present heritage. So I have family heritage where they came from, mm -hmm. but I'll never be an Italian or I'm not an Irishman or, you know, any of the other mixes that some of us are. My present heritage is I was born and raised in the United States. So what did that teach me? Who am I from that experience? How much of it do I embrace and how much of it do I not embrace? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, these learnings that get passed down to the next generation, that is a supreme uh, purpose waiting for those that come into age 65 and beyond. There's a wonderful piece of work to be done there. Only if people tell us that it's there waiting for us. Otherwise, we don't know. It's not there. There's no roadmap. There's no framework. And that's what our work has done you know, is to say, there is that framework, you can go learn it, you can see it for yourself. And now all of a sudden, life can be practiced as a craft. The way we do our trades, occupations and professions with some structure, with some purpose, with some framework. Now you fill in the blanks as to what color it's going to be, is it going to sparkle? Or is it going to be, you know, kind of just brush nickel, you know, what do you want it to be after that? Well, I often wonder why people will go and volunteer and do things like at the library or at a museum or at the schools and things like why you're retired why don't you just go enjoy life because they feel like they need to pass something on to the next generation so and you know what they're enjoying life when they do that yes they are aren't it they helps, it helps you to live a little longer if you ask me it sure does so if people want to say read your books or to to listen to to more of what you have to say because it's quite obvious we can't cover the whole shebang in one hour of no how, how do they go about finding more about you go to mylifemasterpiece.com mm -hmm. and that's going to flip you to something called the life masterpiece journal you know, that is my place where I'm leaving behind that heritage that I, we were just talking about. And there's also the audio journal that's there. It's, it's part of that, uh, that they can then click in and listen to the podcast episodes that talk about this. So the written word and the, and the audio uh, episodes are there. Mylifemasterpiece.com. Okay, we will put the link to that in the description. And so that way people can just go click on it and, and learn more about you. And so if, uh, do you have social media that people can follow? Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, the pod chaser that we were uh, talking about a little bit earlier, uh, where, you know, all the podcast episodes are, I keep that up to date with all the different podcasts that I'm a guest on. It's like, okay. it's up to 40 now, I think in the, recent history. And uh, so yours will be there, obviously. So that's, that's, that's the best place, you know, to go to, uh, I think, to, to listen to different, you know, episodes, you know, with different podcast hosts, you know, 
because every podcast host is the same they we, we had a great time today pulling out the stories of your grandfather and and uh you know that that's that's good deep stuff and every podcast is a little different so that's gonna be a good one i don't know if you remember uh nbc well you know you probably don't you weren't here in texas but there used to be a show that would come on sundays i believe it was sunday but uh ron stone from nbc uh, news on uh, it was channel two news in houston they would have uh it was god i can't remember the name of it but it was a look around texas basically okay. featuring oh, yeah. different special uh -huh. things about texas and they actually came to baytown and did a segment on my grandfather for the craftsmanship that he did so wow that's a fabulous piece of legacy man you have got to make sure the next generation gets that I got to find out if, if I could find the video. Maybe oh, can... you've got to go deep. Well, listen, when you're in your mentorship phase, that 20 year last, that 20 year period, mm -hmm. that's on you, that, that right there, that's on your workbench. You got to get that done. I'm going to write that down as I'm going to, I'm going to go check on that today. As a matter of fact, that's a beautiful thing. I'm writing that down. Well, I would like to thank you for taking the time to spend with us and to enlighten us a little bit more and. I uh, I commend you for what you're doing, and I wish you all the best in everything that you do. And thank you to everyone that watches or listens to us. Without your support, we wouldn't be here. And I hope you take everything that Mr. Collins has said, Collins has said to heart because it can really make a difference in your life. Don't just take the easy route become a master, become a master of your life. And until the next time, thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe because it's only through your support that we're able to continue doing the things that we do. And until the next one, have a great, great day.